We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everybody here for uh, the last session of a great conference. So uh, I think we have some exciting stuff, some good stuff. So uh, we are here for strategies for due diligence and site closures uh, this morning. So uh, three different little sub panel sessions going on here. So uh, my name's Richard Carmen. I'm the vice president of environmental services for universal engineering sciences and I'll be moderating this session today. Um, so without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our first uh, presenter here, uh, Brett Bohanton. He'll be speaking to us about isopropyl benzene. You're not on the list, get to the back of the line. So Brett, thank you. Thank you everyone. Uh, thanks for staying late on a Friday. I'm pretty sure you got your uh, CEUs yesterday. So hopefully you're just excited about isopropyl benzene. Uh, my name is Brett Bowenton. I'm a project manager for Aptum Environmental in Tampa. Um, isopropyl benzene, I've seen it a bit in my career and it's got me curious. Uh, I spoke with other PGs uh, in my company and different other companies and it's basically they say, well, it just breaks down uh, a lot slower than your B-Texas. So um, seen it through due, due diligence and assessments and it's kind of curious. I kind of want to share a couple of my experiences uh, with it and maybe open the discussion a little bit later on. Oh, the green. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so basically what I want to go through is kind of just a, a brief little chemistry 101 about isopropyl benzene and discuss the regulatory limits associated with it. Uh, and then kind of go into why it matters, uh, liabilities and issue, especially with property owners uh, and also professionals as well. Um, seen it a lot uh, pertaining to historical issues. Uh, and then property complications uh, for property owners. Uh, so I'll use a couple examples uh, through due diligence, um, a PRP side example, and then uh, performance-based cleanup, advanced cleanup for our redevelopment. There we go. All right, so here's the molecular structure of isopropyl benzene. Uh, it's a benzene ring with uh, what one of my colleagues calls the devil's horns found that <laughs> uh, it has a much lower solubility uh, than the other major volatiles such as the B-Texas. Um, I believe uh, benzene uh, is 1,750, where if you look at the solubility for isopropyl, it's 50 milligrams per liter. Uh, it's a colorless liquid that does have that sharp, pungent gasoline type odor. Sorry, guys, there we go. <laughs> Uh, in the environment, uh, we do see it as a, uh, a product uh, in the production of uh, acetone and phenols. Uh, it's also commonly found in crude oil, which is where, uh, in some assessments, you see it when uh, Table D is performed on waste oil tanks. Uh, it's also a fuel additive in various grades of gasoline, so there actually is a percentage different that's added between your regulars and your mid grades, but also between different retailers, where Circle K may have a higher cumin uh, amount than, say, a racetrack or a 7-Eleven. Uh, in the environment, it's uh, released uh, through spills, emissions, uh, mostly through leaking storage tanks uh, above ground and underground. Uh, and it's also found in cigarette smoke. So if you need another reason to toss out that pack of Lucky Strikes, there is one for you. Um, it does readily absorb the soils. It does have a higher uh, coefficient than the other uh, major um, volatiles. Uh, 700 is the KOC for isopropyl benzene, whereas uh, benzene is around 80, 83. Uh, so between the solubility and the KOC and knowing that it uh, degrades a little bit much slower uh, than the other ones, I think there may be some sort of correlation there, but it's something that I will continue to, to look into. Um, and looking at the cleanup target level specifically for Florida, uh, we have the leachability, direct exposure, residential and commercial values. Uh, we do have a very low GCTL value for this, uh, much actually lower than benzene itself, and also a very low natural attenuation default concentration. Um, if you do see a laboratory report where you have an eye qualifier, uh, you can look at the selection of analytical methods to find the target PQL uh, for isopropyl benzene, which actually is two, and it has a very high freshwater marine surface water uh, threshold <laughs> as well. Um, so the table uh, to the right, I found this in a, a paper that I found really interesting, and I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, these are the 14 states that do have uh, threshold values for isopropyl benzene. 
as you see, Florida, the eight there is for uh, the NADC. But if you go to other states such as Maine, the 450 micrograms per liter is actually the residential standard. So there are higher standards there for your construction worker and your commercial um, divisions. Uh, I also found it weird that Texas and California aren't listed on that table considering they do have fairly stringent uh, regulations. So. All right, so the examples I'll talk about is isopropyl benzene and uh, environmental due diligence. Uh, everyone, I'm pretty sure, is familiar with uh, due diligence. This is your opportunity to find out any and all environmental issues associated with a property, whether it be through a transaction or you're just doing a uh, looking at your own property yourself. So the benefits of looking at this during your due diligence is that comprehensive baseline. Like I said, due diligence, you can look for anything and everything. Don't kill your budget just by sampling for everything under the sun. But say if you do have a gas station or a suspected gas station with maybe a release or a suspected release, it is something that you should look into. Um, this also helps reduce your potential liability if you purchase the property. If you don't search for it and it ends up being there, you buy it, you own it, unless you have something congratulately stating uh, such. Uh, this is your chance to find any historical contamination if, uh, if you are able to trace this to a historical release, you can submit a circle rescission request to the FDEP. Um, and if it's accepted, it can be returned to the state funded program uh, for rehabilitation funding. Uh, for permitting support, um, if you just look for your B Texas, you may not have any exceedances and you can proceed with obtaining dewatering permits as a non contaminated site. Uh, however, if you do look for it and find it, it's there, your site does switch to contaminated. Uh, if you didn't, and you went ahead with your permitting process and your dewatering, you have the chance to actually exacerbate the contaminant plume. And if you draw that plume closer to say where you have an active tank and then 10 years later you have a release, it may be much more difficult to say that that release is from a historical one or rather a, a new one. Thank you. As far as property development and planning, we just briefly discuss dewatering. Uh, we can talk about the facility layout, uh, its structures and drainage. I know in Miami-Dade County, they do not allow perforated pipe in areas of groundwater contamination. So if you do have isopropyl benzene in those areas, they will make you put solid pipe in, in those areas. So it's also important to look for there. Uh, it can also uh, affect your treatment and disposal. So if you do have elevated benzene concentrations and you are dewatering with your treatment, you know, you may be able to get by with an air stripper, but if you have a heavier volatile that's floating around with much higher concentrations, it may have an effect on what treatment you ultimately have to use, whether you have to switch to some sort of uh, carbon or a different method. Um, and then you don't want to <laughs> discharge uh, contaminants that you aren't aware um, into the surface waters. So, so the example I'll have, uh, this is a uh, due diligence project that's familiar with, um, was purchasing an active retail gas station. Uh, historically, it's been operating as one since 1972. Uh, in 1994, oh, I'm sorry, in 1990, 1988, there was a release that was entered from the EDI program based on the results of some groundwater samples collected around the tank pit. Uh, 1994, those USTs were removed and new tanks were installed on the opposite side of the property. Uh, historically, there was assessment that went from 1992, followed by monitoring for three years, and in 2000, the site received a CERCO. So here's the layout of the property. It's, sorry, you can't really see it, but you can see the current USTs that were installed in 1994 on the northern portion of the property. Uh, if you look towards the south and the southwest, um, those were the areas of the 1972 USTs and also the 1988 uh, EDI release. So during the due diligence, you wanted to look at, you know, your current fuel system, you wanted to look at the historical USD system, which would have been uh, MW3 at the bottom. Um, MW2 also covers an offsite issue uh, from a plume adjacent property that starts to migrate across the road. Uh, kind of same for MW3 on the southern property as well. Um, so if you do your sampling and you just sample for BTEX, well, it looks like uh, your phase two is pretty good and you can proceed as a non-contaminated site. You have a little bit of a detection down in MW2, but the one thing that kind of sticks out is uh, the dilution factor uh, showed up in benzene for MW3. Having seen this before, there's obviously a non-target analyte that may be showing up causing that dilution. Sure enough, if you add isopropyl benzene to your account, you actually have very high concentrations in that area. 
Um, now, is this a new release? Is this an old release? Well, we know the research that the tanks on the north side are actually upgradient of uh, our area. Uh, I'm sorry, upgradient of the release. And if you look at the historical plume here, our uh, isopropyl benzene concentrations are in the area uh, at, during the contamination assessment of the highest concentrations here. So based on this data, and also that we know that the old, the newer tanks are upgraded and were uh, non-detect for isopropyl benzene, uh, the site was actually able to uh, be put back into the program through an approved circo rescission request. So the next one I wanna talk about is uh, something I've seen uh, through the PRP and site assessments. And so this is a former gas station site in Pompano Beach. It's uh, currently a uh, parking lot for a boat store. It had USD is also uh, in 1972 that operated until around 2000, 2008. It's kind of unsure exactly when they were removed. Uh, there was historical assessment and monitoring from 1988 to 1995 with a low score, it dropped out of funding range and kind of set. Uh, so with this, there was a low score assessment that was gonna be performed with your basic soil loring, soil sampling installation, uh, well installation and groundwater sampling. Um, working with the regulator, uh, we determined that the best course would do, be do our soil assessment first. And based on what we see with the ODAs and based on the lab analysis, determine where we would install our monitoring wells. So the historical USDs were kind of to the east of the, uh, the current building there with the, uh, the product piping and the dispensers. So we put in a good amount of soil borings at this site. Um, we found very high OVA readings below the water table and chased those to the Southern property boundary. Uh, for our soil analysis, we did have uh, benzoapyrene exceeded in one area, um, kind of in the middle, and then uh, benzene uh, exceeding the leachability kind of around the building. One of the soil samples collected away from there had U qualifiers for the benzene, but it was obviously a dilution based on probably non-target analyte. So discussing with the site regulator, we talked about what we'd seen in our experience and what it could be. So it was determined that we would install a monitor well in that location and sample it for 8260, the isopropyl benzenes especially. Now, once we sampled the well, isopropyl benzene was present. We returned to the site and actually sampled the remaining monitoring wells for isopropyl. So this is just the BTEX plume here. Uh, there is a small area uh, above the NADC for xylenes, um, but the rest are GCTL concentrations that would get you natural attenuation. A uh, little bit of delineation is still required, but say it were delineated and the site had a high score, it would go to possibly active remediation to address the NADC concentrations. And you see it would be extremely localized, but if you add the isopropyl benzene analysis to it, your plume's actually much larger and actually takes up the majority of the property. Uh, you're actually not delineated in almost all the directions except for the east. Um, the east is actually your up radiant for the site here. So if you proceeded to and do remedial action on just that one small area, you're actually missing a large portion of the site that needs to be addressed and also portions of property that are offsite. So this can completely change the way that you uh, prepare your, your remedial action plan and, and go on forward with it. And just another short, small example is how this can be seen in uh, performance-based cleanup and advanced cleanup uh, uh, for site redevelopment. Um, this property had an assessment where they looked specifically for the B-Texas uh, and their course of action was, we are gonna do a source removal in the area of the known soil impacts. Well, they dewatered uh, below the water table to get everything out below the smear zone. Uh, I believe they added ORC pellets at the end of it and they backfilled. Once that portion was completed, a third party came in and performed due diligence and found us a propyl benzene on the property. So after discussion with the regulator and the other party, it was determined that ice propyl benzene would be added back into the um, sampling protocols going forward. So after the source removal and the work, this is what the contamination plume looked like. You have a GCTL plume with not that high concentrations and your NADC plume is extremely isolated to a small area. Um, but if you add the isopropyl benzene concentrations and your NADC area is much larger. So kind of thinking about it before, if isopropyl benzene would have been analyzed for beforehand, 
it may have been found in other areas, which may actually um, change your entire course of how you're going to address the site. Um, at this point, you would have to go back and do a wrap mod. It would completely change your milestone. So looking at things uh, up front forward definitely has a benefit in an area like this. So for the conclusion, the takeaways, just kind of want to talk about the baseline for the due diligence, how it's imperative that you do look for something because if you can tie it back to historical release, the state can pay for it rather than you do. Uh, also dewatering and permitting assistance. Uh, we discussed the treatment um, also for the dewatering. It's also a potential time savings as you can see through um, moving forward with the site and then finding it much later, which changes your direction. Kind of talked about a couple of things, remedial technologies. Uh, I've seen a couple of sites where Aerospark and SV has been uh, very efficient at remediating. Uh, bioremediation, the sulfate enhanced bioremediation is actually interesting where sulfate is injected uh, in the subsurface to help speed up the uh, degradation. Um, and then typical groundwater extraction and source removal. I've been a part of many long-term NAMs for isopropyl benzene where it's constantly going and it just doesn't show any sign of breaking down over time. So it's not, one that I typically would would recommend. Um, and while they're sometimes there, they're not always. Uh, the 124 and 135 trimethyls are also found in that 8260 list. Um, they don't show up every single time isopropyl benzene does, but typically uh, they do. It's kind of a little Amazon review. If you like this, uh, the World Health Organization has a good write-up. Uh, but this uh, paper I found is the uh, International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. It's actually written by a handful of uh, doctors uh, at Florida Gulf Coast and Florida State. Uh, I found it extremely helpful. Uh, they go into detail about the sulfate enhanced by remediation. So if you found this interesting, I would definitely recommend looking this up. So does anybody have any questions? Oh. Any questions for Brett? No? All right. <laughs> Thank you. Good job, Brett. Thank you again, Brett. Good job. All right. For our next uh, presentation, we're going to have Donna Klein and Rickard Lampler as a, a tag team duo here, and they're going to be talking about soil blending of chemical oxidants to accelerate site closure. So, Donna, Rickard? Thank you guys for sticking around. Um, I'm going to go first, and then I'm going to hand it over to Donna, and then I'll uh, I'll close us out here. Um, but uh, yeah, we decided to use uh, ISCO to kind of accelerate the process for our site closure. Um, we're going to be looking at a case study that's pretty near and dear to my heart. Um, it's actually my first site that I worked on that got a closure. Um, and it is where I studied. Um, I'm a Gator graduate and I'm pretty straight out of school. Um, so it was cool to kind of go back to Gainesville and work on this site. So I'm gonna be taking you guys through the introduction um, with our conceptual site model for the site. And then Donna will be speaking on all of the remedial efforts and then I'll uh, wrap us up and show you where we are today. So the site is in East Gainesville. Um, and for any of you that are developers, East Gainesville is an up and coming area in Gainesville. West Gainesville is where the university lies. It's where a lot of the residents are. Um, East Gainesville is predominantly low income area. Um, however, there has been a lot of recent developments that have occurred in East Gainesville, including this former gas station, um, the former Dixie Oil gas station. Um, it was redeveloped into a Wawa by a developer where we have a close partnership with. Um, fun fact, the address is 1007 East University Avenue and my fraternity house was 1012 West University Avenue. So kind of the mirror image of Gainesville. So it was the night before Christmas and all through the house, not a creature was stirring except for DEP in issuing a discharge notification. Uh, it was 
December 24th, 1987, and this discharge notification was issued. Uh, the discharge was recognized a few weeks before, um, but DEP works hard and they, uh, they decided to issue this discharge notification right before the holiday as an early holiday present. Um, but um, as you can see the, uh, in the image on the right, there is the fuel tanks, um, and that was actually where the source of the discharge was located. Uh, it was unknown how much, uh, how many gallons of petroleum actually was discharged. It was unleaded gasoline. Um, however, kind of based on the assessment done, it seemed like it was quite a bit. Um, so historical um, side assessment, the OVA ranges were anywhere between 200 and 1500 ppm. However, there was no recognized, when we were handed the site, there was no recognized soil contamination. It was only groundwater contamination. Um, depth to water is pretty shallow out there, three to five feet below ground surface. Uh, and then you guys can see our lithology all the way down to 30 feet. So around 30 feet is where we were seeing that sandy clay with limestone. Um, but the top lithology was predominantly easy with some sands, um, but then we did get into some clays. Uh, groundwater flow was south to southeast. So our conceptual site model with the groundwater flow was, if you guys can see, I'll try to use the laser. I don't think the laser works. Um, <laughs> but the kind of center of the site where you see the mounding just north of that, um, there was the former USTs um, at MW1. And then the groundwater flow was to the south, southeast, and kind of extending all the way almost off site under the road, uh, which is First Street. So you can kind of see our plumes. Um, that middle plume is isopropyl benzene. <laughs> uh, good thing we looked for it, but it was. Um, extending all the way, it's a 200 foot linear plume all the way under the road. And that aliphatic group really does help it transport further than the other constituents. Uh, the diagram on the right is ethyl benzene and benzene, which do extend a little tiny bit under the road, but not, not significantly. The concentrations right at the road were pretty low detections for uh, benzene and ethyl benzene, and then the naphthalenes were pretty close to the source of the discharge. So um, with the help of Michael Goldstein, this project was uh, entered into the Brownfields program. Um, so the developer wanted to address the offsite contamination um, going for conditional closure, um, and they wanted a cost-effective option. So with all of this in mind, the priority score for the petroleum program was pretty low. So they weren't going to get, they weren't eligible to receive funding at the time of redevelopment. So they decided to go for a voluntary cleanup under RMO, uh, under an RMO two or three closure. Um, predominantly, they wanted the RMO two closure, conditional closure, but with the groundwater plume pretty significantly reduced. So our remedial strategy was to attack the source of the contamination. So we were going to do a soil dig and then down gradient. This is where we implemented the ISCO soil blending. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Donna and she's going to speak about all of the remedial options or all of the remedial action we took that took place. So, Client wanted the offsite plume, so we had we had um, benzene and isopropyl benzene and I think something else going offsite. So they wanted the offsite plume clean, and they were okay with an RMO two closure. But um, so the only way the way we decided to attack this, and there's you go through several iterations, but we said let's do a source removal at the source where the tanks were. And in the down gradient plume, let's do a soil blending. And we did four trenches with, um, and we soil blended closure SP with Portland cement as the activator. So I'm gonna, and we thought that would provide a barrier to prevent offsite groundwater contamination with time. So green button. 
big one. The big one. So here we are, we got closure CR. The first thing we did was the four trenches on the down gradient plume. And we used closure CR and Portland cement. Um, we used about 8,000 pounds of closure SP. I got that wrong, closure SP, which is just sodium persulfate. And then we used the Portland cement as the activator. And um, we, um, as, we, as we did the mixing, and I've got a video to show you, we had to monitor the pH. So we monitored the soil pH to make sure we were seeing pH is greater than 12 during the mixing. So here is our video. And um, I, just, I, got, I guess I wanna just kind of describe this a little bit better. So the top four feet, there was no vadostone contamination. So we took the clean soils, put them over here. And then we dug a trench from four to about 13 feet, and we moved that contaminated soil elsewhere. And then we put in um, one super sack of the Closure SP and two super sacks of the Portland cement, and you'll see the mixing process here. So low cost technology, we had the equipment on site because we we're gonna do a soil excavation of the source area. Very simple, we got contact. That sodium persulfate, there is no doubt that it had contact with the soil. And it's just about, you know, not maybe sometimes we don't have to get real fancy. This is real simple. And this took only three hours to do, the four trenches and working with this contractor who had the right equipment on site and could just mix in and get good contact. So here you see he's bringing in some of the contaminated soil and then remixing it here. You know, and, and there were a lot of clay soils here. So I think the process of just mixing probably helped volatilize a lot of the contaminants as well. So the, once we did the four trenches, so we got the down gradient plume taken care of, we went and did dewatering and soil excavation of the on-site plume and uh, discharged under NIPTES. So all that went well. Um, here you see we're doing still more soil excavation. And then we knew we couldn't get all of the contaminated soil. We were gonna leave some of the contamination in the bottom of the excavation, just a kind of a cost benefit analysis. And so in the, in the bottom of the, of the excavation, we use closure CR, which is sodium persulfate and a calcium, calcium oxide. And that was just to give some long-term oxygen to keep the, get that down, get that plume cleaned up. So again, very simple, very simple. And uh, you know, I'm, I, I kind of love this. <laughs> So here we are dewatering and soil excavating, and you can see them in the bottom um, left, right corner, applying the closure CR to the bottom of the excavation. Real clean, real easy. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Ricker. Thanks, Donna. So you guys are probably wondering how effective was this? Um, well, it was very effective. Um, within the source zone, we immediately went to non-detect in the first quarter sampling event. Uh, and then the concentrations down gradient, we saw concentrations of isopropyl benzene persist for a little longer, um, but it attenuated over the course of the following year. Um, so in summary, we applied about 8,800 tons of the closure SP with the Portland cement to do the blending down gradient. Um, we did the soil excavation, dewatering activities, and applied the closure CR to the source zone. And we saw contaminant concentrations decrease to non-detect in the excavation area source zones, and down, down gradient concentrations attenuated over the following year. Um, we were going for an RMO2, but we actually got an RMO1 um, after about six quarters of PARM. Um, here is our letter from DEP with uh, the help of Michael Goldstein. Uh, 
It was a very happy day indeed. It was my first SRCO. Um, it only took about a year and a half to get closure, but all of the remedial efforts, like Donna said, took a very short amount of time. Um, we had the equipment on site, soil blending took a very short amount of time, and then the excavation um, took a few weeks. We wanna thank Michael Goldstein. We wanna thank our client, Brightworks Real Estate. Um, we want to thank the Terracon team and Proxy Kim, Ivonic, um, and then everyone here at FRC as well as Gene. Um, our contact is on the screen. And feel free to contact us and we'll take questions. Good job. Questions? One over here. If you could wait till the microphone gets to you as we're recording so we can hear the questions. So, gentlemen in the front mm -hmm. row right here. So you said that um, water table was like five feet here, but you were mixing in uh, uh, those products from five to 13 feet. Mm -hmm. And were you doing any, did you do any dewatering to dig those trenches all the way down that deep or what were your, it was just very clay. So you didn't have problems with sloughing. Is, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, no problem with sloughing, just narrow trenches. And um, it was pretty dry when we first did the trench. And, but then as you start the mixing, the water slowly infiltrated and we got good slurry kind of going. Yeah. Next question. I, I have a quick one. Um, look at the, the mix ratios you had for the, the closure SP and the Portland cement. Were there any concerns with that much Portland that you were going to solidify materials mm -hmm. in the subsurface and create any kind of physical constraints or changes to the subsurface that way? Yes. Um, every single party involved was concerned, um, except for the Terracon team and the Ivonic team. Um, they were pretty, Ivonic was pretty convincing that we weren't going to have any issues with the uh, kind of solidifying of the material. And in fact, we didn't really have any solidifying of the material. Um, it just saved the slurry the entire time. And then when we backfilled, we had good compaction um, and we, uh, we were able to, I mean, I guess also having the short amount of time that it did take, but we did not have any solidification of the Portland cement. It was a cost-effective act activator. So that was predominantly why we chose to use Portland cement because of how cost-effective it was to get those pHs that we needed. Yeah. No. More questions? Everybody wants to get home for Turkey, right? <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Riker. Thank you, Donna. Good job. Thank you. Okay, moving along. And last but not least, we're going to have Ryan Tuttle uh, take our third session, our third component of the session here, and he's going to talk about strategies for transitioning from active remediation to site closure under chapter 62780, risk management options, level three, using non-declaration of restrictive covenant institutional controls. I feel like I just gave a presentation. So. <laughs> I'm glad everybody uh, could hang around for this presentation. It looks like we're gonna get you out of here early. So that's good for everyone. Um, this site is, uh, we started active remediation on it back in early 2012. And we wanted to be able to transition to closure after these active remediations and convince DEP that it was ready for closure. So what's the question we always get from clients? Are we there yet? Are we done with this site? Can we turn off the pump and treat system? Can we stop injecting at the site? Um, when can we ask for no further action uh, at this site? So um, that's always the main question. You know, they want to control costs. They want to be done with this thing. So uh, chapter 62780 has the framework to complete these, the requirements and the framework to complete these closures under RM, RMO2 and RMO3s. Um, you've got to make sure that the risk management um, option you're selecting is uh, specific for your site conditions. Uh, and it's never too soon or never too early to, uh, sorry, never too early or never too late to plan your exit strategy at a site. So first thing you wanna do is develop your site closure strategy. Um, you know, 
the requirements are in that chapter 62780. Uh, you got to know your plume size. You got to know if it crosses uh, adjacent property boundaries. Um, is it affecting any surface water bodies? Um, and the main thing that we're focusing at this site was to make sure that the plume was stable and it wasn't affecting a marine surface water body downgrading of the site. Um, before you can assess uh, stability at the site, though, you got to have to stop active remediation to see how the plume responds to um, uh, termination of the active remediation. So you want to get concurrence with FDP. So one thing we did at this site was have active communication with them and presentations to go over our, our closure st strategy, our closure plan. Um, we wanted them to identify any, any red flags that they would have um, to our proposed site closure plan. Um, we wanted to make sure that they were okay with our institutional controls that we wanted to uh, apply at the site. So the site history for the site it is a former optical lens manufacturing. During their process, they used uh, chlorinated solvent. So we were looking at TCE and all of its starter products and 1,4-dioxane. We started the assessment in 2010 um, and DEP gave us approval in 2012. And based on that assessment, we determined groundwater flow direction was to the west towards a adjacent marine surface water body and that the GCTL plume extended offsite. So we submitted a wrap to DEP in 2014 and began our bioremediation injections between 2014 and 2018. Uh, the purple area, let's see if I can use the pointer here, here is the initial plume extent on the shallow and intermediate zones. The yellow is the plume extent after we finished remediation and that was based on our last PAR monitoring event. Uh, we experienced 80% decrease in CVOC molar concentrations. And like I said, reduction of from, from 20 acres to six acres in the shallow zone and to 11 acres in the intermediate zone. So one of the things we identified with our communications with FDP that we had a couple data gaps that we needed to address. Uh, we didn't know the northern extent of our plume boundary, so we need to install some monitoring wells in both the shallow and intermediate zones to identify the, the plume boundary to the north. They also wanted us to, uh, to demonstrate that our groundwater wasn't impacting surface water, um, so we had to complete some poor water sampling uh, to make sure that we were below, below marine surface water criteria. And at the southern property boundary, we had a natural, we had to demonstrate to DEP that a natural hydraulic divide was um, uh, stopping contaminant distribution to the south. So these are our poor water sampling locations. Uh, all these came back below marine surface water criteria. Um, our monitoring wells here and here and the intermediate and shallow zones were all below GCTL, so we could define our northern extent of the plume. So I previously stated we uh, had significant mass reduction in the shallow and intermediate zones. Um, you know, this provided a qualitative line of the evidence to show DEP visually that the plume had decreased since the initial plume extent in 2010 to our um, last PAR monitoring event in 2020. So to uh, prove, to demonstrate to DEP quantitatively, we, we did man kendall trend analysis when we only completed on um, the data following the PARM events. We wanted to show that the plume was still stable after we stopped uh, remediating it at, at the site. And we had multiple criteria that we applied for this uh, trend analysis. So this is our shallow zone trends uh, in a table. Uh, we showed that most of the shallow wells were below GCTL or had decreasing trends. And this is our table for our intermediate zone. Um, we showed 88% of the wells had a decreasing trend. We had a couple wells that had increasing trends with daughter products, um, but they weren't increasing on a molar equivalent basis. Um, we had one well that showed an increasing trend in molar equivalents. So what we did was look at downgrading wells to see if that we had an increasing trend in the down gradient wells, which we didn't have. So that pr proved that the plume wasn't increasing down gradient. 
So this is what the this is the letter that every client's looking for. Um, DEP agreed that our PAR monitoring um, showed that the groundwater plume was shrinking. Um, our poor water samples demonstrated DEP that we were below marine surface uh, water cleanup target levels and our groundwater wasn't impacting surface water. Um, they were okay with our uh, non-recorded IC that we wanted to apply to the site and we met the technical criteria for an RMO3 closure. So we used a non-recorded uh, IC consisting of a swift mud shape file. This will stop anyone from, um, if they try to pull a well permit within this area, it'll flag it in Swift Mud's database and FDP's database um, that they need to do special provisions if they want to install a well at the site. So in concluding, um, you know, it is feasible to transition from long-term remediation to an RMO two or three closure, but you want to co coordinate with FDP to make sure they're on board and that you don't have any data gaps, or red flags that could, you know, be a road bump to your closure. Uh, you want to consider your breakdown products. You know, you might have increasing trends with your daughter products, but your overall molar equivalents aren't increasing. So, you know, you don't have an issue with that. Um, you also may have fluctuations in the internal cons, you know, trends in the internal area of the plume, but if the down gradient uh, boundary of the plume is not changing in shape, then your plume is still considered stable. Um, you, when you're considering your ICs, you want to make sure that, you know, find out if your property owners, adjacent property is amenable to DRC, you know, deed restrictions. If not, this uh, Swift Mud IC, ICs are a good way to um, restrict a property without putting in a deed restriction on uh, neighboring properties. Um, two water management dis districts have accepted this and um, you can be on the lookout for other water management districts that may start accepting this type of IC as well. Any questions? What two water management districts accept it? I know Southwest does. Uh, St. John's. They do, yeah. nice to know. So. Did everybody hear that question? It was which, which two water management? Okay. Question uh, about the process to get the Can you repeat your question? Could you elaborate on the process for, between uh, getting Swift Mud to agree to the non institutional control? Uh, within the ICs, there's a specific um, GIS file that you have to send them. Um, it's sent over to them and it has to be in their format and then they basically, you know, it's part of the closure. So they'll, they'll be able to put it within the um, institutional control registry on uh, Oculus. So. More questions? All right. No takers, so good job. Thank you, Ryan. All right, well, we made it through in record time. I think like a good consultants, we drove efficiency, right? And delivered. <laughs> so, um, so I guess that basically ends this. I know Gene wanted to have some type of closing since this was the last session, and I don't think he's here at the moment, is he? Somebody maybe stick their head out the door and see if you can flag him down and, and let him know that we... Uh, when at warp speed, is he coming in? Yeah, I'm yeah. just thinking maybe two. <laughs> yes. I presented in 2018 at four o'clock and literally it was five people. Oh my God, this is horrible. Yes. I ain't even worried it was going to happen again. Right, and then I, right, and I had to deal with traffic on the way home. This was rush hour. Oh, like, this is a nightmare. This is a nightmare. Clear. Right. Clear roads. That's what we hope for. Uh, exactly. I heard it three hours just to get here this morning. Uh, the Eastbound San Francisco fuel <laughs> spill <laughs> over <laughs> right at Champions Gate exit. Oh and my. you know Champions Gate <laughs> always has traffic <laughs> to begin with. So. And yesterday it was paint. All these yeah. paint cans. Yeah. Last night. <laughs> <laughs> and like paint was everywhere. I didn't know there was a fuel spill this morning. I bet you it was probably like they were trying to clean it up. Yeah, and they I had think it so. Spilled it, 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 and then the tanker truck probably flipped or something. Like that. Gene, we finished in record time, so I was trying to corral you and let you yeah. let you close out. So. Oh, yeah.
this is the second I was in 2019 <laughs> Nice meeting you. Good job. Nice meeting you.